thank you very much um, uh, the entire IDS fraternity and also to the organizers and uh, for the participants, thank you so much for taking your time joining us today. Um, uh, this uh, topic that I am going to present today is uh, part of the research that I was doing with the pastures, pastoralism, pastoralism, resilience and uncertainty, a project that, that ended recently whereby my PhD was uh, also part of that. So uh, we co-authored a paper with a, a colleague from Pastures program, uh, Mikhail Nuri, and the paper is, uh, is yet not published. So it's part of that uh, discussion. And uh, I'm linking this to the International Year of uh, Camelids. So happy International Year of Camelids, wherever you are. And uh, yeah, let's get going. Maybe you can move to the uh, next slide. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because uh, it's the year uh, United Nations declared this year for the uh, celebration or even acknowledging the importance of camels in, in people's livelihood. So uh, to begin with, uh, I just want to know uh, what comes to your mind when you hear about, about camel or even camel milk. If uh, you can sacrifice two, three seconds and maybe put down in a chat, what comes to your mind? like? Uh, Anything interesting, intriguing? Just note down like what what you see when you hear word camel anywhere. So please do drop that in the comment just to analyze what how people know about camel or even what they they perceive of camel. So uh, that is it. And then um, camel is a very important species. Uh, there are around seven of them, uh, seven species across the world. But in Kenya, we 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 have we have this one called dr dromedaries. So uh, it's really important, especially in terms of contributing to the sustainable development goals uh, around the fight against hunger, poverty reduction, and also uh, women empowerment. Because in the context of uh, Kenya, where my case study is based, uh, most many a time camel production is uh, camel milk production is managed and owned by female herders. So it really en enhances females' uh, economic empowerment and also uh yeah livelihood opportunities and also why camel is important because it contributes to nutritional and food security a study has shown that in kenya uh the nutritional composition of people based in pastoral area 50 percent is derived from camel milk or even uh camel related uh, uh material materials so it's a very important in terms of contributing to food security especially in areas where agriculture farm uh, farming is not uh, viable due to ecological condition. And recently, I know many of you have seen it maybe on TV, you've seen organization restocking uh, camel to pastoral in Northern Kenya, Samburu, Siolo, Matsabet, because it has been identified as a one uh, species that can withstand climate change and also it contributes to sustainable ecosystems because um, uh, like for instance, uh, compared to cow and other livestock it it reduce, it produces uh, less methane which contributes to greenhouse gas emissions so it's uh, environmentally friendly and also camel is very important as it contributes to cultural and social values for people across the world uh, it is used as a form of exchange for dowry inheritance and also for compensation when there are crises between communities and also comparing camel to uh, let's say cows uh, or even cattle or even a small ruminant it has longer lactation compared to other livestock. And because of its uh, long uh, dry drought resistant trait, it can withstand water uh, without, stay without water for quite a number of days. So that is what I can tell you about camel, but you can share what, what you know about camels in charts. So um, in Kenya and even Africa, camel population is estimated to be in Africa, basically estimated to be between 32.7 million. But in Kenya, it is 4.7 million. That shows like, uh, of course, it's not visible everywhere. Like we don't get to hear about camel everywhere every day, but it is a significant number in terms of population, just considering how the condition in pastoral area is variable and also harsh climatic condition. But let me take you to now camel milk. Uh, I was in this WhatsApp group for Camel uh, Owner Association, and then uh, with the, there was someone shared the photo on the price of camel milk in the U US. And it really surprised me because uh, like 500, milli 500 ml of camel milk was going for 21.99 USD. 
that is going to about 3,300 Kenyan shilling at the moment. So, and that is only like 500 ml. And then someone visited a store in uh, Isiolo and found that camel milk powder, which was about 900 grams, was going for 4,700 4, shilling. But do you know that the price of camel milk from the farm per liter is only 80 to 90 shilling? And to the final terminal market in Isli, per liter is going for 200 shilling. And look at that price, how it is not even double or even triple. It's just so much. So the, the price difference from the local price to international price is very different. So um, this shows how camel milk is valued outside. Rahma, you can go to the next slide. So uh, having seen the, the, the price of the camel, uh, why is that so much valued? I think it has many health and therapeutic uh, benefits. Number one, because it has high content of vitamin C, vitamin A, and so it's considered like uh, to for treatment like diabetes, asthma, even eczema. So that is number one. And then uh, many a time people with uh, lactose intolerance problem, uh, they can easily digest uh, camel milk. So it's important as, as, as such also. And also uh, from even practical experience without even scientific evidence, of course, even scientific evidence is there, but is camel milk is closer in composition to human milk. That means even like people, children who are very much lactose intolerant or even cannot breastfeed, they can easily be substituted on camel milk. So it shows how it is beneficial. And finally, also it has a longer shelf life than the uh, cow milk. So, <clears throat> Um, why, what is the reason why the camel milk marketing is expanding in Northern Kenya or even, even in across the, the world, including Somalia, Ethiopia, and other, other places, including even the market in the US. So as I mentioned earlier, climate change adaptation is, very, is one of the key why, because camel is considered a resilient animal, so it has been restored to the communities. And because uh, people need to diversify their life livelihood, they have to to, to, to practice uh, camel milk marketing. And secondly, uh, in Isiolo, where uh, this re research was based, uh, there was also support, in, of course, minimal, but infrastructure, infrastructural support, especially uh, uh, milk cooling plants, uh, also training by organizations such as VSF, uh, SNV, quite a number of them, I can't name all of them, but EU funded project USA. So all these organizations have been supporting resilience program, especially around uh, camel production. So because of this and infrastructure development, there is highly, uh, uh, highly uh, uh, people are highly adapting to, adapting to camel marketing. And also in, 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 beside the infrastructure, the transport infrastructure, especially the motorcycles, which link camel in the uh, camel milk from the rural markets to centers like Isolo and even Nairobi. So this improved transport mechanism has really enhanced the uh, enhanced camel milk marketing. And finally, uh, because of uh, need for diversification, especially for women and the young, young population who cannot access live, livestock, but they can use livestock means or produce to sustain their livelihood. So. Um, now, uh, did you know that in Kenya, Kenya is one of the, it's actually world's largest camel producer and it contributes to 10% of annual milk production. Like if you remove the cow milk and other milks that are available, camel milk is like 10%. And also recently, uh, FAO stats ranked Kenya's milk production to 1.16 million, 5 million liters. So, but then the more, the major problem is some 50% of this milk goes to waste because of uh, un un proper handling, hand improper handling and also uh, like when it is rejected from the collection terminal. So now having talked about the important about camel, so there are a few challenges that camel production uh, entities face, especially around the land use pressure because camels have to move and because of pressures and competition from uh, mega infrastructure, insecurities, people cannot move their animals. So it becomes really uh, challenging. And these days, I think disease is something that is almost under underscored, but it is a very imagine it's a very serious thing. Some of them even very mysterious. People do not know the cause, so animals just dying suddenly, having very complicated symptoms. So a lot of emerging disease and even others reappearing. So it's really problematic for camel producers. And then, of course. In development of infrastructure enhances camel milk marketing, but that is like 0.11%. So there's a lot of limitation in terms of cooling and handling facilities, even road infrastructure. Sometimes when there is flood or when there is insecurity, it's very difficult to, 
transport milk from the farm to central market and also uh, like what availabilities like uh, like like recently when the what was it called um uh, El Nino was anticipated. People were trying to move the animals to highlands area, area. So it's very difficult to deal with these variabilities. So now having talked about camels and their challenges and important, uh, let me take you now to the moral economy. Rahma, you can stay to the, on this slide as, much, as long as I, I talk and then I'll tell you to go to the next slide, please. So um, moral economy is something that has, has often actually been overused. It has been used in many contexts in, in various ways. It's one of the terms that can be applied in whatever situation, as long as it makes sense to the writer or even the, the scientist working on, the, on that concept. So for this purpose, I'll just track you briefly to how the concept uh, came about um, and what it, the, the theme that it summarizes. So uh, maybe some of you know it originated from those early essays by E.P. Thompson's trying to understand how, trying to resist the capitalistic exploitation in the early centuries. So this one, they use moral economy to mobilize people so that they can resist that kind of action. They cannot uh, like uh, lower the price of bread during that time. And also it is applied also in transnational movement and ethnic nationalism. Uh, basically also all this is trying to bring people in the same identity together, people with the same identity together so that they can look for a particular goal or even protect particular common good. So it's all this aspect of mobilizing sense. So uh, it is rooted in that mobilization, collective action aspect. But also moral economy uh, is rooted in redistributive practices. Like for example, in Islam, um, the aspect of uh, wealth on, uh, I mean, uh, tax on the on wealth. Like for example, if you have wealth, livestock wealth included, you, there is a particular uh, tax you pay annually, and this kind of tax is called redistribute. It's redistributive, like it's given to the less endowed community members. So, and it is uh, rooted in religious norms and values. So, it is kind of also moral economy, but this one is more not on collective mobilization of uh, uh, struggles and uh, stuff like that, but mobilization in terms of redistributing resource. Okay, bringing this moral economy concept back to the pastoral perspective perspective, it's more on uh, livestock transfers and redistribution, um, livestock transfers and redistribution, but in, in the historic context, it was, all, it was perceived to be patriarchal because it was only male who can own and have access to that animal and they are the ones who have say and decision on who to distribute that animal to. So um, if you talk about like that moral economy, among the women, it's mostly pictured in this aspect of rotational savings among women. In Borana, they call it marrow, whereby women can, uh, you know, collect resources together and redistribute that resources you know, on a rotationally monthly or even weekly basis. So that is the tenant of moral economy. Uh, next slide, please. So for, for my PhD, because I was looking at the moral economy and how it's changed from 1975 to 2020, the 45-year changes, uh, I was looking at how that changed. And uh, building on all these resources about moral economy, going back to historic time, uh, I defined it as a set of traditional, as well as recently created network of relation centered on collective and redistributive transfer of values, cares, and some form of solidarity to help people survive everyday crises. So, uh, for me, basically, it is to survive, no matter what means. Is it about be, with, with redistribution, with uh, you know labor sharing, and this kind of stuff? So uh, for that purpose, we have uh, I had uh, five uh, practices of moral economy, and uh, number one is uh, what we call normative redistribution. These ones are the moral economy practices that is embedded in society's norms and cultures and values. Like for example, the one I, I said uh, among the Borana community, like they redistribute livestock when someone is uh, affected by drought or even calamities. So that is embedded within the norms and values of the community. But also um, there is moral economy through comradeship and collaboration. And in this case, this moral economy is not necessarily rooted within the norms and values of the community, but because people need to capitalize on their labor relationships, on their resources, sometimes even you need to uh, bond with people so that you can access secure grazing land. So this kind of uh, relationship, we call it moral economy through comradeship. And then there's also the third one, the moral economy through diversification. 
this one not necessarily diversifying into economies, but the most important thing is the non-economic aspect of diversification. For example, how can the resources that is diversified be distributed, accessed, and also who has the power to decide on which economy to diversify? So all these things, it takes power relationships within the household to decide to send children to school, to send the woman to market to sell milk, to send the man to herd the animal. So it is within this family circle negotiation that community um, communities are able to diversify and uh, we categorize this as a form of moral economy. And then uh, before last one, it is the institutional and moral economy. As you know, pastoral areas have been interacting with agencies like state uh, development agencies, religion, because many of these pastoral communities initially had their own customary uh, practices but now because the, the state is moving closer to them the religion like islam or even any other religion is going closer to them so they have to adapt to this changing dynamic so what happened is their normative practices are becoming institutionalized i can give you an example for ex for instance uh the case of harambe harambe has a root in uh, political move like social uh you know pulling together but now co pastoral communities now are highly practicing this aspect of harambe because they're no longer like so much embedded in redistributing livestock, but they are so much practicing redistributing cash or even supporting people to go to school and stuff like that. And also, let's say, and Zakat, one of the institutional support uh, is also being practiced. Like annually, you see people giving heifers and camels and small ruminant to their hardening, hard men and stuff like that. So um, finally, there is the component of moral economy where, where we define it as collective defense, whereby pastoralists can band together to respond to crisis or even to collectively you know, make voice for a particular, uh, a particular uh, thing that they want to achieve. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, now that we know what moral economy is and how it is categorized within camel, uh, uh, I mean within pastoral communities, let us now tie this to camel milk marketing. And for this purpose, uh, I use the case of Anole. Anole is a women-owned uh, camel milk cooperative based in Isiolo. It was established in the 1990s. And then uh, it started a bit with about, I think, nine people. And to date, uh, there are about 90 plus people who are members. So some members coming and go. So you see how it has transformed throughout this. It was established as a cooperative uh, uh, in 2010. So now in a nutshell, this is how Anole cooperative works. So membership, as I said, it's by women and they have a main manager and also like technicians who are hel helping within the, the, co the cooperative. And then, uh, there is the, the milk source whereby it's located in a very hinterland, very like rural remote place area. And this one is now the herders or even sometimes the members themselves have camels. So, and then the, the milk is taken from that uh, rural place to what to rural border border. Border border is a motorcycle transport within Kenya. So there's specific, special border border within the rural context who collect milk from the farm and bring it to the central tarmac collection center. And still remember, this is in rural place. It has not yet come to central market in Isiolo. Once it is collected in now, like in central collection in, in rural area, it is taken by another border, border team that is now the tarmac or even the, uh, the other part of the journey. They check it and now bring it to milk processing cent centralized places. Uh, and in this case, Isiolo Central, whereby Anole have their cooling plants. So they do, they test the, the milk, they test for, for you know, water content, germs and stuff like that. And some milk, milk are rejected. That is why I was saying there is 50% wasted many a time because some milk is rejected, some is con contaminated. So once the milk is now processed, then it is transported to terminal market in Nairobi. Initially, what Anole used to have is, uh, they used to put their, uh, plastic jerrycan on the rooftop of public buses and lorries, but these days they have refrigerated truck thanks to the uh, external support that they got. And then finally, the milk goes to Isli and then it is sold in market as wholesale to restaurant. And these days you find many places like camel milk tea, camel meat soup, and so many camel related uh, products, camel yogurt, camel cheese, camel sausage, all stuff like that. And then finally, the payment mostly is done by cash and also in, in PESA because the most interesting part is those people who are based in a very, very remote farm, a camel farm, and those based in Isiolo and those now taking milk in Nairobi, they have, some of them have never met, but they just send the money through in PESA, they send the milk. So it is a transaction that goes on without people meeting. And then it is a very 
you know, dynamic and reliable system of marketing compared to this demand supply led market. So these entities, these people ensure that the milk is supplied even in difficult time. Even if there is insecurity, they have to make ways of maneuvering through to deliver this milk. And this is the backbone of this economy that is all often not given consideration. Please go to the next slide. Okay, now let me tie the three together. Now the moral economy, we understand what moral economy is, and then we go to know the operation of camel milk marketing, the cause of anole. But now what traits does that moral camel milk marketing entity have in terms of moral economy? Um, uh, I'll take you back to the slide. Uh, if you remember, I was talking about the moral economy through identities and you know collective struggle. This membership, the membership, like, uh, like yeah, within, no, just continue on that, on that slide. Yeah, yeah, let's stay here. So um, you see the foundation of moral economy. It's about collective action. It's about mobilization of people to resist, you know, negative thing. But also it's about protecting common goods, but also, you know, like these women group who are coming together, sometimes perceived, women are perceived to be, you know, vulnerable because they don't have access to livestock. But now, despite that, uh, difficulties, they band together, they form women group or even uh, that entity, and then they, 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 they respond to crisis in terms of getting economic autonomy, they have access to resources so that they can run their families. That membership itself shows, shows a part, such a trait of moral economy. And then in terms of identity, what even ties this group is so many you know, complex identities, so it's, apart from being women, like there are also that clan interaction, like women from the same clan. So I am in this group, so I tend to influence women from another my clan. So and then religion also. Most of them they are Muslims, you know. And then some of them get to know of this entity through family network, kinship, age stuff like that. So it is a very fluid identities. And of course there are negative and positive aspects of it in terms of who is included, who who is excluded. But the thing is that gives them identity and make them even like consider it's not just the economic gain but the aspect of social gain because this person comes from my family my kinship my you know uh, lineage or my agement then we have to band together to do this business together and then thirdly aspect of labor organization um this camel milk marketing many a time gets attention because it's important thing is nutritious but then deep down the the hinterland what happened is like from the milking milk is smoked traditionally by uh, different hubs and then labeling of the jerry can. They have this plastic, plastic jerry can then transported from different and cooling until marketing. Do you think all these things is happening in vacuum? No, what happens is this labor is really, you know, is, is facilitated by different forms of communication. Like you have to be reliable, you have to be timely, you have to, you know, you have to adhere to certain rules. You have to make sure that the milk is not contaminated. And this labor organization, people have, overcome the barriers by building trust and also establishing different norms and, and uh, uh, values that guide their relationship. And then uh, I know critics of moral economy, like there is the aspect of uh, individual and collective action. The business is individual business, but what, what makes it morally, economically viable is the aspect of collectiveness, solidarity and flexible perspective. Let's say if there is crisis, let's say there's insecurity within the milk transport route, what happens? They have to communicate, they have to look for a means of hiring a, a van or something so that the milk can be brought together. You see that togetherness, these people do not, like, they are whole by this aspect of being together and showing solidarity in, in, in short term. And also beyond that, uh, beyond economic gain, especially the women, like they have the monthly contribution whereby they support the sick among them, they support the needy among them to take their children to school. So it's the social aspect that comes out of this other individually driven business. And finally, uh, maybe you can uh, also put in the chat here, what are the limits of this moral economy? Who is included and who is excluded? Uh, that's a challenging thing because as I said, sometimes it is rooted in clan, family, stuff like that, but also it's free for people, other people to join, but then, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is among this women group who are forming this cooperative, they are widows, you know, they are like widows, they are um, divo divorces, all kind of uh, vulnerable uh, women. So it's a, a aspect of building solidarity within the, themselves. So let's go to the next slide. Tahira, try to move faster. The timer. Yeah, I only have two slides. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, uh, just uh, this is the second last slide. So um, why is seeing camel milk marketing through moral economy is important? Number one, many studies that, which amazing studies that has been happening is mostly looking at value chain, microbial content of camel milk marketing, economic return, et cetera, et cetera. But the moral economy perspective gives, uh, brings out the hidden adaptive capacities of local agents and network to respond to social, political, and ecological uncertainties in milk production. Because of course, market is important, uh, the content, uh, the nutrient content of camel milk is important, but these adaptive capacities of individual is what makes pastoral livelihood resilience. And it is these people who many a time are not recognized and even acknowledged for resilience building purposes in pastoral areas. And also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, diverse network within this network uh, connect urban and rural places and also support livelihood of marginal groups, especially the women and the young, by creating employment opportunities and also generating income. But also, uh, there is policy dilemma here. Like This informal network and arrangement is very vibrant, dynamic, and helpful. But then we have this external intervention that come with fixed marketplaces, fixed infrastructure, making people you know, fo follow rules and regulations, very formalized. So how can the trade-off between these two can be balanced? So it's a question that we need to think about and maybe come together again to discuss the answer. Final slide, please. Okay, in, uh, now to summarize, uh, you've seen how chemo is important, the challenges that it has, and then the moral economy behind the commoditization of this uh, amazing product. So how can camel milk marketing and camel production be supported to get value for its global outlook? I think we can contribute to this uh, debate uh, by putting our notes uh, in the chat, but I have four takeaway points. Number one is taking the moral economy lens seriously. We need to go beyond you know, the market infrastructure or the cooling plant and recognize the importance of and flexibility of this uh, agents involved in camel milk marketing. Secondly, I think there is significant need for infrastructure support, especially cooling plants and, and also transport and uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, in terms of even facilitating transportation between these places. And then thirdly, resource allocation, especially the national government, county government and international, they really need to rethink how the budget and resources are allocated for camel production because you've seen the value of this animal even internationally. And finally, there is high need for investment in camel health, vaccination, disease control and stuff like that because of course, people also need knowledge on how to manage this animal because many agencies are restocking the, this pastoralist with this animal. So know how and also investment in disease is very important. Yeah, that is from my end. Thank you very much.